All right, and we are live. So um, let's start this again. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're presenting episode seven, Implications. My name is Jess Farrell. I'm the community coordinator for the Software Preservation Network at Educopia Institute. And I'm filling in today for Jessica Meyerson, the community advisor to the Software Preservation Network and research program officer at Educopia. Um, so thanks to Jessica for setting us up great for this webinar. Um, this is the seventh and final episode of our seven-part series of webinars exploring the Fair Use Code and other legal tools for software preservation, co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone but the host and the guests will be muted through the webinar to max the AV quality of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Every episode will be recorded, transcribed, and posted to the SPIN website, freely available for all. Today's discussion will take place with members of the Code of Best Practices research team and esteemed guests, Ariel Katz. Ariel Katz is an associate professor at, uh, at the Faculty of Law, University of Toronto, where he holds the Innovative Chair in Electronic Commerce. Professor Katz received his LLB and LLM from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is SJD from the University of Toronto. His general area of research involves economic analysis of competition law and intellectual property law with allied interests in electronic commerce, pharmaceutical regulation, the regulation of international trade, and particularly the intersection of all of these fields. Next is Tim Walsh. Tim is the digital preservation librarian at Concordia University. Prior to joining Concordia, Tim was a summer fellow at the Harvard Library Innovation Lab and a digital archivist at the Canadian Center for Architecture, where he developed a digital preservation program and software preservation projects to address issues of obsolescence for 30 years of digital design records. Your research lead and facilitator for this episode is Peter Yassi of the Washington School of Law at American University. Peter is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices movement and is a co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices. Today, Peter, Tim, and Ariel will discuss why licensing isn't a viable solution to copyright issues and preservation projects with global reach, how U.S. fair use law applies to initiatives that involve foreign materials, how preservationists and other countries can take advantage of local law and the code to advance their work, and the roles that they can play in advocacy for better and more flexible copyright exceptions. And with that, I will turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Peter. Um, Peter, please unmute yourself, or I will, here, I got it. Now let's try that. How about that? I hope I can be heard. That's great. Uh, yeah. And before I talk about anything substantial and before I turn the time over to our two wonderful guests, I wanted to say a special word of thanks to two groups of people who are part of this webinar today. First, the, 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 the hardy, hardcore who have been with us for all or most of the last seven weeks. I'm grateful those of you, those of you who have dropped in and out can, as 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 you've heard, find the episodes that you missed live online. And then I also want to uh, to welcome several people who I know are joining us today because the special topic to which we're going to turn in a few moments after I have made a very few brief introductory remarks is the the case study of Canadian law. And so a number of people from the Canadian archival community and the software preservation community in particular are joining us today. And we're very, very happy to have you uh, as part of the session. I want to start by introducing a, a few of what might be called the big ideas of international copyright law. But I probably should say first why I talking about international copyright law in the first place. And the answer is that over the course of the seminar or the webinar, we've had a number of questions about what this code of best practices for fair use that was developed 
by U.S.-based lawyers and practitioners for use with U.S.-based preservation projects means for the rest of the world on the one hand and for U.S. projects that have some amount of global reach or participation on the other. And in order to address those questions, there are a few basic technical legal concepts that need to be put in play. The international copyright system is based in a group of treaties. You've heard of the Berne Convention, for example. It's one of several that provide cross-border protection for copyrighted works. If two countries are in one of these treaties and a work originates in one of those countries, the other country or countries are required to protect it. And they're required to protect it more or less as they would protect a similar domestic work. And that's the second big principle that you see here in the bulleted list, so-called national treatment, a kind of variant of the golden rule. If a foreign work is, if a use of a foreign work protected via a treaty is challenged in another jurisdiction, then the nature and to the largest degree, the extent of protection will be determined under the local law of the country where that challenged use occurred. That's national treatment. And then finally, the third piece in the, in the mix is uh, a set of rules that lawyers refer to as international conflicts of laws principles. Because sometimes a dispute has connections with more than one jurisdiction. And those jurisdictions may have different legal approaches, either in, in broad strokes or in fine details, to how such a dispute should be resolved. And in those situations where there are several countries involved, the conflicts of laws rules that I've just mentioned come into play. Slide, please. So the reason everything I've just described is important is that, of course, the code of best practices is about a principle called fair use, which exists in the law of the United States. And that principle isn't a universal principle. It's a country-specific one. So the... the um, the world is essentially divided into three groups of countries, a small but growing group that have fair use exceptions, broad, flexible exceptions to copyright built in, like the United States and some of the others that are listed here. Then there are a so-called fair dealing countries, which have similar but not identical flexible exceptions, and you'll be hearing a little more about the fair dealing approach to, deal, to copyright exceptions from Ariel Katz in a moment, because among the important fair dealing countries in the world is Canada. And then there are a lot of countries, including most of Europe, <laughs> which deal with exceptions to copyright law, including exceptions for cultural purposes like preservation under what are called specific exceptions. There's something that is or could be, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't in practice, written specifically into the national law that says, well, you can do archiving in this circumstance, but not in that circumstance. You can do preservation under these conditions, but not under those conditions. And I think it's fair to say as a generalization, although I'd be very interested to, to know whether others agree with this generalization or not, that broadly speaking, most of the countries that don't have flexible copyright exceptions, fair use or fair dealing, are pretty far behind the mark in terms of bringing their 
specific exceptions up to date for the realities of contemporary digital preservation. Next slide, please. Next slide. So here, again, the US code that we've been talking about for the last six weeks is a very good, reliable, fairly middle of the road set of guidance principles for the application of fair use to preservation activities when the preservation activities are based in the US. But if preservation activities are based somewhere outside the US, if we're talking about a UK based or a Canadian based or a French based software preservation program, then of course, the country where the program is located, where the administrative staff is, where the computer servers are, is going to be an extremely important source of law. In other words, if you're running a preservation program out of France or the Netherlands, you have to think about how the things you are doing do or don't comport with the copyright law of that country, both what it prohibits and what, by way of exceptions, it permits. It's also the case that we need at least to think about laws of countries other than the source country, if you will, or the host country or the base country, when a project is of global scope and when material is being uploaded to the project servers from locations other than the one in which the program is based. Because uploading is, a, is an activity which in the current digital moment, copyright law takes very seriously. And there's at least a possibility that if a French institution were uploading files to a US-based consortium of legacy software, French law, just to give an example, might come into play. Next slide. As I mentioned at the beginning of these remarks, the copyright law provisions of different countries relating to both how extensive the limitations on copyright authority that they recognize, especially the ones they recognize in favor of cultural activities are. They differ in terms of how up to date their laws are. And those differences need to be taken into account. If, and this is a price position that I can't emphasize enough, if someone is trying to get software preservation or other digital archival activities underway in a country where the laws of that country are inhospitable to the practice, relatively speaking, compared with the US, or as I think we'll see in a moment, Canada, then there is an opportunity, indeed I would almost say an obligation, on the part of practitioners to get involved in the law reform or lawmaking process so that whoever is making the rules, whoever is setting the parameters for what is and isn't permissible when cultural institutions seek to preserve legacy software and other leg digital legacy items, know that the decisions they make not only affect high value commerce, but also the maintenance of heritage. So there is an opportunity, and I would say just to, to pound the peg one more time, even an obligation, if you're not satisfied with what your local law provides to try to get involved with changing it. And 
let me then make one point before I turn to our, our wonderful guests, and it has to do with the first of the general topics that was stated earlier as being within the scope of the webinar's coverage for today. In previous sessions, we've talked about how, as a general matter, a licensing-based approach, that is an approach that's based on finding, consulting, securing permissions where necessary, paying the copyright owners of legacy software for the privilege of preserving it, isn't very feasible even at the domestic level in the United States. Those owners are simply too many, too hard to find, and in, in general, too disengaged to be consulted. That's why relying on fair use or on some other copyright exception is so important. Well, if that generalization about the, 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 the limitations of a licensing, the severe limitations of a licensing-based approach is true at the national level, it's true exponentially, it's exponentially true at the international level. Licensing-based solutions aren't going to do the job, in our opinion, which is why, again, that it is so important to both ascertain and consult and, where necessary, get involved in changing the local, the local national norms that relate to copyright exceptions. And with that, since our guests have been introduced, we can go to the next slide. And then right on, please, to Timothy Walsh. Welcome, Tim. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that really wonderful introduction. Um, a little under the weather today, so bear with me if I, if I get a little spacey, that's why. But I'm actually really excited to be talking here today. Um, and uh, Jess, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Um, I'm going to focus, I'll try to talk for about 10 minutes or under, um, and I'm going to leave, uh, you know, any, anything approaching a sort of um, an overview of Canadian law. Certainly, we're going to stay way away from any kind of legal advice. I have no background in law, all that. But I'm going to talk about a case study that I think is interesting because it's international, because there's work that's been happening on this um, in Canada, in the U.S., and in plenty of other countries. Um, as an example of why our problems in software preservation are not really set at the national level and our solutions can't be either, um, and why we need to consider some of these ramifications of international law and international case studies to begin with. Um, so I'm the, the digital preservation, thank you Jess, I'm the digital preservation librarian at Concordia. Before this, um, as just mentioned at the beginning, um, I was the digital archivist at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, which is actually you know, the same subway stop in Montreal. <laughs> it's about a five minute walk away um, for the, the last three years. And um, while there, I did quite a lot of work for the CCA and at the CCA um, and observed quite a lot of work elsewhere in Canada on this issue of the preservation of digital design records. So I'm going to give you a really quick overview of like the what and why of this problem. Um, so <clears throat> to get the acronyms out of the way to begin with, um, when we're talking about digital design records, the records of, of architecture, of landscape architecture, um, to some degree urban planning and sort of related fields, um, a lot of what we're talking about are CAD and BIM files. Um, CAD might be something that you're familiar with. Um, it stands for computer-aided design, sometimes computer-assisted drawing or sort of other variants of those terms. Um, and this describes computer software um, with roots in the 80s going back uh, in the commercial market and available on PCs. Oh, sorry, going back to the 60s and available in a commercial market on PC since the 80s and incredibly popular since the 90s, um, that uh, assists in the drawing of architectural plans for the most part. Um, this was originally 2D software. Um, it's increasingly 3D, and there's a, an increasing overlap between 3D technology used in fields like architecture and design and used in, say, video games or film animation, things like that. Um, the sort of next wave of 
files for design records is called Building Information Modeling, or BIM. Um, this is something that's been talked about for decades. Um, in the last, say, half a decade, has actually gotten quite a lot of traction. Um, and this is quite more sophisticated software than CAD software. Um, the way that it often gets described is that it adds additional dimensions beyond the first three in the forms of time, um, cost, uh, and uh, sort of ongoing building maintenance. But the basic idea is that there's a, a kind of full, perfect digital representation of a building that would follow a building from its initial conception through sort of renovations, facilities management, on to uh, even demolition at the end of its life, and that all the different people involved as stakeholders in the life of a building um, view this one definitive file and, and simply kind of see their views on it and inter interact with the data that they have access to. Um, there are a number of different software packages and file formats that implement CAD and BIM software, but the things that really unite them um, are that these are highly software dependent files. So if we talk about files that can't be meaningfully thought of as as renderable or accessible outside of uh, very particular parameters of viewing software. This certainly checks that box. Um, and that they have sort of notoriously been known as the deep end of the pool for digital preservation challenges for a long time. Um, and if you wanna learn more about these files, I'm gonna go over a little bit in the next slide or two, um, but I'd highly recommend looking at this DPC technology watch report that Alex Ball wrote in 2013, which is by far and away still the best uh, overview and resource on the topic. Um, so next slide, please. And forgive the phone. Um, so some of the qualities of digital design records that make them difficult to preserve and provide access to, um, as you might have guessed from what I mentioned earlier, these are highly complex uh, files and format specifications that involve quite a lot of um, mathematical calculations uh, on the fly. Um, the software and file formats are often proprietary. There's an increasing move towards open interoperable file formats like IFC for building information modeling, but the vast majority of formats that will actually be coming into archives are in very proprietary formats. Um, as a general rule, software in this industry will not read uh, earlier format versions of the same file format, um, and this is largely due to market pressure uh, where vendors want companies to be upgrading their versions every few years, so eventually they start to limit backwards compatibility and make it harder to open the older uh, uh, files. Um, that's not universally true, but it's a, it's a pretty constant thing. Um, files often have external dependencies, or what are sometimes called XREFs. Um, so uh, a, a single CAD file may not necessarily be atomic. There might be elements in that CAD file that are actually getting pulled in dynamically from other files. So we start to have to think about things like directory structure and maintaining those links. Um, and then there's just a whole sort of box around the question of migration. And there's been a lot of projects um, starting at the Art Institute of Chicago and then MIT and Harvard in the mid 2000s with the Facade and Facade 2 projects that have investigated what um, preservation targets might be for file formats for CAD and BIM files, as well as what those pathways and workflows might look like. Um, and some of the recommendations that you'd see in something like the facade report or in uh, Alex Ball's DPC technology watch report, essentially say that there's no one file format or pathway that's going to preserve all the data that we want. So the best we can do is create a bunch of different derivatives of different types that give different insight into the data. And this has led a number of people, including often me, um, to speculate that emulation and software preservation might be better preservation strategies than trying to automate some kind of migration that's um, exceedingly difficult um, and often requires very highly skilled manual labor, uh, or human labor, I should say. Um, that instead of doing that, maybe we could preserve certain environments that will run the software that we need to interact with the files in their sort of original uh, environment. Um, one of the things that complicates that is this question of what exactly it is that we're trying to preserve with these files, and that gets into questions of designated community and significant properties. But I'll say from my own experience, having talked with people, um, their different user communities can often have very different needs. So for instance, a facility manager's perspective, from a facility manager's perspective, for instance, uh, a 2D CAD file with a plan or even a PDF of that plan might be sufficient. Um, if that's what allows for sort of ongoing use of the records for things like renovations. Um, whereas at the CCA, we saw um, quite a number of architectural historians, uh, media studies theorists, and others 
who were actually as interested in this technology and in the process of design as they were in the outputs. So in that case, uh, you know, if we serve up files from 1985 and software from 2019 and say, here you are, here's the thing, that doesn't really give people an insight into that original environment, which is sort of the locus of, of the questions often. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so just to paint a very brief picture of the kind of some of the different kinds of challenges, uh, we could look at two softwares or two different file formats um, as an examples. Uh, so one is AutoCAD, which has been the sort of de facto industry standard for 2D CAD and, and has done 3D CAD um, for a couple of decades now. Um, the native sort of binary uh, file format is DWG. There are some lightweight uh, visualization formats like DXF or DWF that you might see out there in the wild as well. Um, and the nice thing is with AutoCAD, um, files sent basically the earliest versions in the 1980s can still largely be opened in current versions of the software and there are lots of free readers out there. There's an asterisk there because that has only been true for the last few years. Um, and technically the DWG file format is proprietary even if it's been reverse engineered uh, by various people over time. Um, and so there's this question where at the moment, if you have AutoCAD files in your archive and you want to provide access to them, you can get a free DWG reader or a, a current version of AutoCAD, and that should serve the needs of many users, but that wasn't true even a few years ago, and there's kind of no guarantee it's going to be true again in a few years. Um, but that's sort of best case, easiest scenario. Um, one format that uh, paints a, a slightly different picture, which might be more representative of the, the sort of long tail of 3D modeling software that gets used, particularly with more innovative projects, is Form Z or Form Z, um, which is a software that came out of the University of Ohio, I believe, and was incredibly popular in the 90s and early 2000s as one of the first very sophisticated 3D modeling tools that was specifically geared towards architects and architecture. And the, the FMZ file format, um, is notoriously tricky because current versions of the software and even the oldest versions of the software that the vendors able to provide um, will only read file formats, file format versions created in versions of the software after say the mid aughts, which means that the vast majority of Form Z files that might find their ways in, in an archive um, cannot be opened by any commercially available or even sort of the latest generation of obsolete non-commercially available versions of Form Z, uh, which means in my experience, I know in at least a couple archives, at least tens of thousands of files of very important projects for our cultural history and cultural heritage um, that are essentially locked away. Um, and if we can get emulation-based strategies to open these files, um, there's an additional lev level of legal complexity that goes beyond the, the issue of copyright um, because much of the software, like many of its competitors, is protected by hardware keys, which introduces a whole issue of sort of DRM and, and digital locks. Um, so hardly a comprehensive picture, but maybe a little bit of a portrait for you. Um, next slide, please. Um, what I really wanna say is that this is not a national issue. Um, so the countries that are painted in red are ones where I personally have talked with archivists who, or digital preservationists or librarians or uh, uh, folks in working in museums or in government um, who are dealing with this, these issues of preservation and access for digital design records. Um, some of them are working with the earliest records, some more recently. In Canada, uh, the CCA has a really wide ranging international collection of projects um, coming from, from just about every continent on earth. Um, down the road at McGill, they have uh, architectural archives as well for as one example, Moshe Safdi's uh, architectural archive, um, which contains foreign digital materials. Well, out a little further west at the University of Calgary, they're dealing with the same issues. And this is true in plenty of other places as well. Um, so I, I have uh, talked about this with colleagues at the University of South Australia, uh, various folks in the UK, at the Het New Institute in, in Rotterdam, uh, and so on. And the truth is that most of these companies that are the software vendors are very large multinational corporations that are competing in markets around the world. And so a lot of the problems that we're facing are not national problems. Um, the contexts in which this work is happening uh, often are within borders, although not they don't necessarily have to be, but certainly are across national borders in the sense that this work is happening 
cooperatively and independently um, in a number of different countries. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I'll end here with questions rather than answers, and hopefully this gives uh, Ariel something uh, to kind of pick up from or for us to circle back and discuss later. So some questions that I've asked myself uh, for the, the code uh, in a Canadian context include, you know, what from the code and its analysis of fair use can be applied to fair dealing in Canada? As Peter said, fair dealing and fair use are not the same, although they are similar, uh, and the law and code in the two countries are different. Um, so what, uh, what, what can we take? Can we take general lines of argumentation? Can we take more specific details? Uh, certainly court precedent's not gonna work, but there's this question of, of what in the code would need to be adapted and what can be used kind of as is. Uh, another question that I have is what issues arise from network solutions? So if we're going to talk about emulation-based strategies for access to legacy design records, uh, we don't live in a world where most of our servers still reside in the same country. Uh, even in cases where that's true, the move that, which I, I love towards uh, networked sharing of legacy software um, and really of the whole stack of emulators, of operating systems, of drivers, of, of end software, um, you know, uh, the same way that not every institution can afford to do this themselves, I'm not convinced that every country can or should either. Um, so what issues might come up uh, with, say, sharing of software collections for an emulation as a service type solution um, across national borders? Um, and finally, and I think this, this gets back to Peter's point quite a lot, um, how can the code be used as an advocacy tool for building a case for software preservation work in Canada um, and potentially um, emulating some of the work in, in the US um, led by, by uh, folks at the, the Berkman Klein Center, at, at SPIN, at ARL. Um, how might we even try to work towards sort of protected exemptions in Canada to mirror those in the United States? Um, I'd be happy to talk about these later to get people's input, um, but for now, I think maybe the best thing to do would be to hand it over to Ariel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, we are a bit behind, so I'll probably skip some of my slides. Uh, just can we go to the next one? Um, so I, I want to start with some preliminary issues before we talk about fair dealing. Um, and then I'll skip the second point and go to, to, to fair dealing. So. In, in talking about the preliminary issues, um, I uh, um, can we skip the next slide, please? So, so here is a point that I, I have written recently in an article, and, and, and excuse me for the plug, but the simple observation is that libraries predate copyright, okay? And the, the institutional role of libraries and other institutions of higher learning in the promotion of knowledge and the encouragement of learning those functions have been acknowledged way before legislators invented the concept of copyright. And this is something that it's important to, to bear in mind um, for, for several reasons, why it matters. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, first of all, because if we remember that what libraries do, and I'll call it library ink, has been recognized, and the importance of this has been recognized before copyright existed, that means that the activities of library ink form part of the context in which copyright laws, copyright law was born. And it also have, may have some interpretive function because generally when we have legislation, legislation is to be interpreted against the backdrop of previously existing rights and interests. So the argument would be that if, since libraries existed and have been doing libraries before copyright existed, unless we see clear indication otherwise, the implication might be is that the way we interpret the Copyright Act is that the legislature did not intend to take away from or, or unduly hamper what libraries have been doing all along. Now it may also have some uh, implication in countries such as Canada, which is a federal country, because copyright is a, is a matter of, of federal jurisdiction, 
whereas libraries are generally a matter of provincial legislation. So that creates an interesting and so far unexplored interface, but there is some line whereby corporate law, federal corporate law, may not be able to interfere too much with things that fall under provincial jurisdiction. And if we come to the conclusion that copyright law really hampers the libraries in what we're doing, that might create some uh, constitutional issues uh, in, a, in a system like Canada. But beyond that, the fact that, again, library has this ancient recognition, if if any, if, even if it does not have any legal implication, it still has some rhetorical force. Okay, so that I think should empower librarians to be ready to come, look, what we're doing is great, it's not controversial, it it's, has been acknowledged for hundreds of years, we should be allowed to continue doing that without being overly apologetic about that. Uh, let's skip this one too, um, and go on this one too, and we'll go directly to fair dealing. So, okay. Um, okay, so first of all, just to answer Tim's uh, question about what can, what from the code uh, can be applied in Canada. So by and large, most of it. So I think if the conclusion is from the code that under US law, yes, we can do it. By and large, we can do it in, in, in the Canada. The differences are just in, in, in nuance or what things you might emphasize to appeal more to the Canadian context. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, Peter earlier describes three categories, the fair use countries, the fair dealing countries, and the specific exceptions ca countries. So under this view, Canada is a fair dealing country. And the question, is there a difference between fair dealing and fair use? So first of all, as a matter of terminology, is there a difference between dealing and use? No, because you can see that uh, in, so the, in the English version of the act, we call it fair dealing. In the French version of the act, we call it utilisation equitable, which literally translates to fair use. And both of those versions are equally authoritative. So there is, if there is any difference, it's not in the terminology. Okay, but that said, conventional wisdom holds that there is a fundamental difference that under in a US style fair use regime, uh, potentially any purpose could fall under fair use. The only question is, is it fair or not? Whereas in the, in the fair dealing systems, fair dealing may only apply to the statutorily enumerated purposes, which in Canada right now are research, private study, education, power decider, criticism, review, and news reporting. So that entails a two-step analysis. First, we have to ask ourselves, is the dealing is done for one of the recognized purposes? If and only if the answer is yes, then we proceed to the next question, namely, is it also fair? But if it's not to any of those purposes, then we stop at that first step and we don't even ask whether the dealing is fair. Okay, so this is the conventional wisdom. Uh, can you move to the next, the next slide, please? Um, but, but here's Professor Katz's less conventional but better wisdom. Uh, which is actually, there is no difference here, and I've, I've written about that. Uh, I can send anyone who is interested. But the bottom line from my research is that even though we don't have the magic words such as in our, in our legislation, Parliament never intended to limit fair use or dealing to those enumerated purposes. And potentially, as is the case in the US, fair dealing could apply to any purpose provided the valid dealing is fair. Now, uh, so other than just promoting my research here, uh, so first of all, it's, it's, I hope it's <laughs> maybe useful for you to, to know that uh, practically it may not matter much, okay? So I mean, first of all, practically as you will proceed under the conventional wisdom because that's the more prudent thing to do unless some courts says, declare that my view is right, but also because it doesn't really matter because even even if we take the view that the list of purposes is closed that you f and that you first must fit into one of the enumerated purposes, it's probably very likely that 
what all the preservation activities described in the code would easily fit under at least the heading of the purpose of research. And the reason for that is because the Supreme Court had said in 2012, when describing those two steps, said two things. First is that when answering the first question, is the dealing for one of the enumerated purposes, the, uh, to decide what those purposes are, there should be a relatively low threshold. Okay, so it's a very, we interpret those purposes as broadly as possible so that the analytical heavy hitting is done in determining whether the dealing is fair. Okay, so that's where the court says we want to see most of the analysis, not on the categorical question, is it, is it research, is it criticism, and so on. And second, also in that case, the question is, arises, okay, whose purpose counts? And the court says it's the ultimate user, not necessarily the provider of the material or the person who does the copying, but the ultimate user could be the relevant purpose. And in the context of research libraries, the ultimate user is the patron of the library, which very likely all of those activity eventually will be, uh, would fall on, on the research. Okay, so, so the first step I think is very easy. We say yes, then we move to the six factors, uh, which come in the US, the, the, the four factors there are in the act. In Canada, we have six factors. They're not in the act, but they come from the Supreme Court decision CCH in 2004. Uh, the next slide, slide, please. And those are the six factors, and the court mentioned that there could be other factors. Uh, first, is that it's very similar to the US, the purpose of the dealing, uh, the character of the dealing, the amount of the dealing, alternative to the dealing, the nature of the work, and the effect of the dealing uh, on the work. Is the substitute easier? Is it not? Um, I just want to say a word about number four, the alternatives to the dealing. Uh, in CCH, the court, and that a crucially important point that the court made was that the availability of a license is irrelevant. So if if something is fair dealing, it does not stop to be fair dealing because the copyright owner would be happy to sell you a license to do the activity. And the court said that's the case because fair dealing is a right of users. And because it is a right of users, copyright owners cannot take away this right by offering uh, you a license uh, to, to engage in the activity. Okay, so that's a a uniquely Canadian feature that the irrelevance of a license and, and a very important one. Um, so, uh, it, so basically, if you go through those factors again, the analysis is rather similar to what you see in in, in the Code of Best Practices in in the American uh, jurisprudence. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just want to highlight some some differences. Uh, first of all, in the U.S. in recent years, trans the issue of transformative views has been has become very important. In Canada, it hasn't really uh, caught on yet. And moreover, the Supreme Court emphasized that uh, a dealing could be fair even if it's not transformative at all. So we don't have the same emphasis on transformative views as we see in the U.S. in recent cases. Uh, so we don't even need to explain in great you know, or to, to overly emphasize perhaps why the preservation is transformative or not. It, it may help, help, but we don't uh, necessarily have to do that. But here's another interesting point. If, at least for some transformative uses, a court could find that, again, if the, the use is, truly, is really trans, transformative, then the dealing or the, the activity would not even amount to copying of substantial part of the work, and hence there would be no infringement without even considering fair dealing. Okay, so if in, in a truly transformative case, if you copy a work and you do it not in order to create a substitute or imitate the work, but to do something else, the court said in, in this case in Sinar, then there is no infringement, period. Not because it's fair dealing, but rather because no substantial part was even taken. Uh, so this is an important difference and a positive one. Uh, another one, this is not really a difference, but a, worth, a point worth emphasizing. 
The Canadian Act, like many other acts, in addition to fair dealing, also has a list of other specific exceptions. Some apply to libraries, some apply to uh, museums, and so on. And the question is, what's the relationship with the, between those specific exceptions and the general fair dealing provision? And the Supreme Court in CCH answered this question, said that fair dealing is potentially always available. So you, you may, re if there is a specific exception, and it and what you're doing falls under this specific exception that's fine you can rely on it but you don't have to you can always make the case that what you're doing is is fair dealing under the general fair dealing provision and if that's what you want to establish then you don't need to rely on the specific exception uh next one um also in CCH, the Supreme Court emphasized the importance of having institutional policies, guidelines, and other indicators of general practice. So the question, the court asked itself, is it, in a case for fair dealing, does the defendant have to prove that every copy of every work individually satisfied fair dealing, or was it enough for the defendant to show that it had a general practice? that was fair and the court concluded that he, the latter is, is sufficient so especially in the context of libraries because if you do those activities many times there is a policy you don't have to show that each and every copy of each of every software was necessarily fair dealing it may be sufficient to show that you have a policy in a general practice that fits the parameter of fairness and that that would be sufficient uh, and uh, I think ultimately you can go through the details of the fair dealing analysis and the six factors but essentially I think it boils down to the question of whether what you're doing is reasonably necessary for the ultimate purpose and this reasonably necessary for the ultimate purpose appears in all the three Supreme Court cases that came to Supreme Court of Canada and in which the court found that there was fair dealing uh okay just tell me that we need to move to q and uh, uh so let me just i'll skip this one uh okay and here's just the last i think that's almost the last one just a practically a super important point it, now it's not about fair dealing it's about statutory damages uh these are damages that plaintiff can uh, elect to recover without proof of actual damages now, in Canada in 2012, Parliament introduced some caps on statutory damages for infringements that are for non-commercial purposes, and most of what's described in the code would probably be non-commercial. So in that case, the statutory damages are capped at a maximum of $5,000. And in addition to that, it means that the, the first copyright owner who sues and elect to recover statutory damages can get up to five thousand dollars and from that point every pre previous infringement of a work of that copyright owner or of any other work cannot be subject to statutory damages okay so from a practical perspective from an the, the actual exposure of an institution is up to five thousand dollars which is for indiv individuals it may be a lot for an institution it's something that many institutions can, can take this risk. There could be, still be actual damages, but that may be very hard for a plaintiff to, to prove. Uh, I think I'll stop here, yes. Thanks so much, Ariel. Sorry that we had to rush along there at the end. It was also interesting. I really wish we had infinite amount of time to continue talking about this, even though you probably only needed about five more minutes to finish out what you wanted to say. Um, but thanks everyone uh, for bearing with us through uh, those awesome three uh, presentations. And um, now we have just a little bit of time for Q&A. So uh, we can take a couple minutes after 3 p.m. Eastern if you want to. Uh, we will try to cut off by 3.10 Eastern time. Um, we will go to Drew's question first, which has been answered a little bit in the uh, chat here, but I just wanted to throw it out there in case the speakers had any more to add. Um, Drew asks, um, 
does registering a work for copyright in the United States subject the work to fair use here despite the company's nationality and or where the work was performed? And Patricia helpfully jumped in and said, fair use can be invoked uh, anywhere with, uh, within the United States on any material from anywhere, whether or not it is registered here. Uh, do we have any, anything, anything else that the speakers want to say about that? That's a very good answer. That's the, that's this principle of national treatment that I identified earlier. The, the rules that apply to uses that occur in a country or that are subject to a country's law are not sensitive to the question of where the material comes from. The question is a question of where it's used. Sometimes that can be a complicated question because it can be used in more than one place. If, if one were to set up a, a, an emulation tool, for example, and make it available to researchers all over the world, then there would be some question about the, whether or not the laws of all those countries where the researchers sit were relevant. And that's where the, the conflicts of laws rules that tend to focus attention on where the project is based are so important and so encouraging. And there's a lot of interesting material here and I think an awful lot of good news for, for Canadian practitioners um, in, what, in what we've heard so far. What are some other questions? Attendees, please uh, continue to type up in the um, chat there if you want to jump in and ask a question. I just thought we could jump back to these great questions that Tim proposed about the Canadian context and see if there's anything here that we wanted to dig into a little bit more after Ariel's presentation. Um, we were just getting at the second one about uh, what kind of issues might arise from network solutions where servers or disk images may be across the border. Um, does anyone want to chat about that a little bit more, Tim? You created these questions, so I was wondering if maybe you had some uh, some thoughts on them yourself, or if you uh, truly were just uh, hoping to hear from other speakers on it. I mean, I think I'm probably the least qualified person here to be answering legal questions, <laughs> but I will <laughs> say, um, I, I think a lot of what Ariel said in his presentation was really encouraging for me. Um, I, uh, I, I think this is fantastic. Uh, I wish we had talked two years ago, but this is fantastic. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, especially around this, this question of what's ultimately necessary for the purpose at hand. And I think, you know, where a lot of people in our field have independently come and certainly where Spin has been a big advocate for this too, is that, you know, we, we cannot afford and we don't have enough time and we don't have enough technological capability individually to solve these issues of obsolescence that have occurred at this multinational, like very large scale. Um, and I've been very encouraged to see projects like Easy in the United States start to address this from a collaborative angle. Um, and I think today was very encouraging for me personally in thinking that these solutions might be able to be expanded on an international level as well but I, I'm not going to actually say whether or not that's... <laughs> I want to jump in and follow up with a question for, for Ariel, which is you talked earlier and, and so helpfully, Ariel, about the idea that reasonably necessary was the Canadian standard as repeated in the court decisions. Do you think that the kind of oh, sort of economies of scale that Tim is describing that might justify a collaborative project in which software, old software was both uploaded and downloaded across a network of institutions would be likely to fit within that notion of reasonable necessity. After all, one could do it institution by collection by institution, it would just be much more expensive and time consuming. Is that reasonably necessary, do you think? Um, you know, you know, Peter, we can't answer 
uh, we have to, as lawyers, well, it may depend, right? So I can't give you a straightforward answer, no. but, uh, but I think the general point in, in, is that you need to be able, when you do those kind of projects, you need to be able to articulate a good explanation of why are you doing what you're doing and why are you doing in the way that you're doing and why do you do it this way rather than the other way, Taylor? And if you can articulate and have explained why you need to do it on that scale rather than on a smaller scale, why do you need to create uh, multiple copies for, for redundancy rather than a single copy? So if you can explain how the architecture works and what are the practices and why it's considered good practice to, to create more than one copies and host them in more than one, because that would accomplish the purposes of preservation much better than if you do it in create one. So if you can, if you can show that you are aware of the issue and that you're and you have been thoughtful in how you design the project, and there is a reason for what you for what for why you're doing the in the way that you're doing, and that serves the legitimate ultimate purpose, then it's more likely that the court will say that was reasonably necessary. And just about the cost, so in one of those cases, the Alberta v. Access Copyright, the, which involved uh, copying by teachers, uh, the, the copyright owner said, no, copying, it was not, uh, well, they could have purchased, the schools could have purchased more books. Right. Could have purchased more. And the Supreme Court said, the majority said, no, that's unrealistic. If, if a teacher only needs to teach, you know, if they only use an excerpt of, of a book, we can't expect them to buy the, the entire book for every student. So copying was reasonably necessary. That's and okay. the cost saving was uh, was part of, part of the equation. Um, Very helpful. Thank you. Um, I wanted, before we are, before we have to go, well, first of all, other questions. Um, anyone wants to type a question? I wanted, since I see that Graham Slate is with us, I wanted to ask him, and I realized I'm not sure we can actually get him to speak, but perhaps we can get him to type if he wants to, if there's anything that, that he would like to say now about the, the CARL initiative to, how to put it, transpose the best practices of, for fair use into a Canadian guidance document. I think that's an interesting initiative in itself highly interesting, and also potentially an interesting model for thinking about the, the international reach of this document more generally. Graham, is there anything you'd like, to, like us all to know? Uh, hi, Peter, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, yeah, as, thank you very much for the prompt. Um, I've become part of this CARL initiative uh, maybe over the last month. Wait, I'm out of sync here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and we're just sort of at the early stages. I, I wouldn't say that, um, speak, I, I can't really speak on behalf of CARL, but my understanding is that there, the commitment to do a full adaptation of the document, we're not quite at that stage yet. We're sort of investigating the feasibility of that. Okay. But but you're, you're right to point out that it's, it's sort of, uh, interesting in so far as developing a model of whether that is a feasible project uh, across other jurisdictions, perhaps sort of that that's a good point. Um, and I think what we're going to do is while we can't recreate, I think you mentioned in one of your one of your past webinars that it was a 15 year process um, developing this code. So well, I don't think we could Developing we could, all of these codes, oh, all of the codes, family of codes. This that one was done sense. in a year flat. Yeah, so I think we're going to use the methodology that that um, was laid out in the white paper about the permissions culture and software software preservation. I think we're just going to sort of take that component of it and use it as a means to get in conversations with the community of practitioners and lawyers in Canada who are doing this work and encountering uh, copyright issues in their in their work, and um, either develop. Uh, a companion piece to, to the to the fair use code or do a fair dealing best practices right. code if we want to call it that I'm not sure but I think that's kind of where we're at and um, 
we'll be giving an update on the prog progress with the report at the ABC conference in Saskatoon, which is the sort of the, the, the community conference for copyright practitioners in, in Canada. And that's going to be happening in May. So we'll have more information to share then. Graham, thank you very much. I think that's very encouraging. And I must say that, that I think that, that, that what Tim had to say today underlines the, the urgency of the effort and that what Ariel had to say is pretty encouraging news about the feasibility of the effort. Yes, according to Ariel, it seems like we're on pretty um, exactly. solid ground and I, I love Ariel, so hi. <laughs> As do we all. So with that, last chance to type a quick question because otherwise the, the curtain will descend. I do want to point out that although, unfortunately, the webinar series ends today, the opportunity to be in touch with us to pose questions either about this topic or about anything that has been developed or any ideas that have been developed in the past six weeks continues. And anyone who has been uh, in attendance or for that matter, anyone you know who hasn't been in attendance is more than welcome to get in touch and we will make an effort not only to answer questions, but to make sure that within limits, those answers are made available to the whole community that has been formed thanks to your patience and, and your enthusiasm and your willingness to stick through with us through the last seven weeks. So, Jessica, I'm turning it back yeah. to you. I think we may now be fine. As you can see, I don't want to stop, but I think we may get an end. It's hard to stop. It's been a wonderful seven weeks. We've covered so much and we've learned so much along the way. And uh, I doubly endorse everything that Peter said about reaching out to um, anyone. You can just email me or Jessica Meyerson and we can triage your message to the right person if you want. Exactly. Or if there's one of these experts that you've heard, of, heard from over the past seven weeks that you'd like to reach out to directly, you're welcome to do that as well. So thanks everyone. It looks like we've covered all of our questions. Um, please, we appreciate please recommend us. Yeah. to colleagues and friends who may not have been in attendance, but who could might be interested in watching online. Uh, yeah, so huge thanks to the guests and the research team. Keep an eye out for the recordings. Those are going to be up online as soon as we can possibly get them up. Um, and you will be able to rewatch or share or whatever you would like to do with them. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for attending and for sticking around a couple minutes later so we could finalize our Q&A there. Wonderful. Have a great afternoon. Thanks to Ariel. Thanks to Tim. You were you made an extraordinary contribution. Goodbye, all. Thank, Thank you. you everyone.